Is the recording on? Yep. All right, let's get going then. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the TSC call. Not so weekly anymore. This is a public <laughs> call. Anybody is welcome to join and contribute. There are two requirements to doing so, though. You need to be aware and be ready to live by the antitrust policy, the notice of which is being displayed if you're online. And um, the other piece is the code of conduct. So nothing fancy there, but just making sure we got all the basics uh, taken care of. With that done, we can move on with the agenda. Is there any announcements anyone wants to make? No, all right. So we had uh, four, three quarterly reports actually submitted, uh, some of which had been uh, quite late, but eventually made it. I haven't had a chance to check if uh, since yesterday when I finished the agenda, there was like very few people among the TSC members actually reviewed them. And I saw Brian pointed that out in his email. And uh, it'd be good to know what the status is. See, it seems like we've made good progress. Is there anything anyone wants to bring up? I saw there was a comment from Dan on the Aries uh, report. Yeah, the maintainers diversity section, or oh, contributor diversity. I mean, this is a message for everyone really to take at heart that, you know, you can't just say, yeah, it's pretty much the same. It's like, well, nobody remembers what that was. So this is a request for everyone to make an effort and actually put the list, you know, what does, where do we stand with regard to diversity? That way we don't have to go fish for that information if we want to find out. Yeah, that makes sense. It's worth updating the wording on the uh, template though, um, because it kind of sounds like just tell us the delta. Um, so if you, if you want, if you want a direct link, it's uh, you probably get it if you put it in the uh, the blurb. And uh, I saw there was a question from Gary on the Explorer, and I saw just before the call there was a comment posted also from Jonathan who is saying, hey, is, is Explorer even working at all? <laughs> so do we have anybody from the Explorer project? I, I responded to Jonathan on, on the TSC call just, just again, <laughs> just before the call. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, uh, you know, Jonathan seems to be uh, uh, frustrated there isn't more progress. And I <clears throat> assume the uh, Explorer team would also mm -hmm. share that sentiment. But uh, he characterizes it as not active. And I don't think that's um, backed up by either the... Um, the act, uh, actual activity or by the report. Um, they haven't uh, implemented uh, or finished with uh, two dot, uh, Fabric 2 support yet, but um, it's in progress. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure they would, they would welcome help from, from other folks uh, more familiar with Fabric. And then, uh, you know, we do get somewhat back to the question of, is it their obligation to support other frameworks? Um, and I think in the absence of people familiar with those frameworks showing up to help, I don't think, you know, that's a fair criteria or critique of, of them. Uh, unless we were to see evidence that they were pushing other help away, you know, or telling people we're not explicitly not going to support that. And I haven't seen that, but, um, uh, you know, I haven't exhaustively read every email. Um, but uh, I, I would say those would be signs, you know, if there were absolutely no commits over a, a quarter, if there were, you know, or, or was active discouragement of new contributions coming in, uh, those would be the signs that this is not a, a healthy project and, and we should perhaps roll it up. Or if the core contributors all kind of said, hey, we've, we've got reassigned, we can't move on, kind of as it happened with Composer. Um, but, and, and no one knew was stepping in to take their place. But I, I don't think Explorer is there. And I, and I, would, I was really happy to see their, their review, their, their report. 
All right, thanks for that input. I mean, you know, this idea that we could, you know, make it mandatory for projects to support, you know, one platform or another, I think is counter to the whole spirit of open source, which is essentially volunteer based. It's like, you can't right. force volunteers to do <laughs> things they don't no, want to do. You know, it's the lead follower get out of the way kind of principle, right? Um, like yes. uh, 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 the, the most we should be expecting or the least we should be expecting is that, you know, when somebody does show up, um, that they are welcoming them and, and, and trying to figure out how to make, you know, something work and break, uh, support for other, uh, other platforms. But um, uh, yeah, I don't see any evidence they haven't uh, the, of, of the opposite. No, I would, uh, I mean, I, I've talked to a few of the folks over there. I think, you know, they did have a problem before, right? I think there's a, the team has come back and tried to do some stuff on there. Um, just to mention on my question is it was really more around, I mean, I understand why we always ask about diversity and diversity of maintainers and contributors and all that stuff, right? Um, I don't always believe that you're going to get a million contributors on projects, right? So to me, another interesting metric on something or whatever is how many people are actually using it, right? Um, I think that's a, right. I mean, look, if, if I don't have to contribute to something and I can use something, right. Why wouldn't I? Right. Um, uh, so that, I think that was kind of that just so people know, that's kind of where my question came from. I think that's just an interesting thing to see like, what's the uptake of that type of stuff. Right. Because then maybe other okay. people will want to contribute or it's just good to know. Right? That's actually an interesting um, not, question for the TSC would be, um, you know, one of the ways other projects have uh, tried to answer that question is through telemetry. Um, you know, uh, stuff that, that sends a ping when it gets started up, you know, and, and that obviously has pretty negative privacy implications, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, you, you want to make it able to turn it off, but if you have it off by default, then you have really no idea, right? Um, I mean, stuff like when you install Ubuntu, it sends a ping. Um, a lot of other software, you know, certainly, certainly um, does that, but we haven't done that, I think, for any of our projects. I don't, I don't think, um, and no, nor do I, I. I think we want to recommend it, but I don't know. It's an open question uh, if that's something we should do. I, I don't see any other way really to measure usage out there other than having some sort of callback or ping. Yeah, because um, even downloads is tough, right? Because half the time, like we have like automated tools that like <laughs> you know that like download our own stuff to test it. So you end up with like this kind of weird number if you test like every hour. But yeah, I, I, you know, it's, people sometimes it's a read from the community, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you, you know, I, and I, I think it's just you know more they talk about being in the community and things like that. I guess you know it would just be interesting, right? If they have you know some stuff that's in there. But yeah, I agree with you. It's hard to it's hard to it's hard to measure, right? Um, if you're not going to accurately measure, right? If you weren't going to actually say, you know, download and register. But. Um, All right, anything else on any of the reports for that matter? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the things in the borough report was someone went and looked at the number of contributor or um, patches that were submitted or something like that and the thing came up about how the tool works um, and I think Rai's comment was that they were not DCO compliant so I don't know if that's a common across um, many of them yeah I did, I did look at that and in a in a moment where I didn't have time to focus on it and I'm confused by who that is. Um, I also don't understand how it got past our DCO check that has always been enabled. Um, in what way are they not compliant? It's a fake email. So it's a fake string that looks like an email, right? You can't send email to that. Uh huh. Okay. And then uh, there were some commits that were of. This, this is a merge, so it's fine. Uh, but I've noticed that uh, not necessarily on this repo, but there are commits of this form that just have the verified check, which somehow the DCO uh, bot doesn't flag. Mm. And uh, talking about DCO yeah. is really <clears throat> my least favorite thing to do, so. Yeah, this is... I will, I will tell you that almost every project has this 
because this is a uh, an email domain that comes up a lot. Um, you actually can send email to that um, uh, account, but not through that email address. In other words, if you figure out the account is is the first part of the email there. Sure, and there there are ones that have the even more fake uh, hidden address where it has, you know, a hash appended yeah. to it, and those are, you know, of the same yeah. There's form, a right? setting that you can make so that it obscures your uh, yeah. Yep. But um, almost every project has this problem. Mm -hmm. um, there's an awful lot of commits that have that type of signature. Um, it's especially true when people are submitting, you know, sort of forking it, working in their personal repo and then just submitting a pull request directly from, from their account. That's usually how it comes across. So is there anything we can do? It seems like everybody says, yep, yep. Um, That's the problem, but. We don't have a bot's going to have to be told that that's not a valid email. I didn't call this out uh, here in particular to pick on Burrow. It was that I noticed because when I was doing yeah. the report, um, when I was looking at the, the stats for it, I, I noticed this, that they had this committer. No, and, and I'm not trying to pick on Burrow here either. I just, it seemed like it was common across many projects. So, yep, it is. I'm also wondering if it impacts the, a topic for later on the election. You know, who's an eligible voter? Um, I'm assuming this address would not show up as an eligible voter either, right? I'd have to ask Dave. Yeah, I thought he was on the call. I am. <laughs> but anyway, it's just something to keep in mind now. So. Yeah, that's, that's, so that adds to the issue of DCO, which we already have an issue open as to how much do we actually need to know about who the person really is. And so it seems like in addition, we can't even rely on the bot to validate that there is something like looks like in a real email address. Okay. Anything else? All right, if not, I think we can move on. There was a caliper report is due. And the next one, I think, is Fabric. We'll start the Q3 reports, and Fabric is the first on the list. So that brings us to the discussion part of the agenda. Dave. Thank you, Arno. Um, I just had two updates for everybody this morning. Um, the first one relates to uh, how we want to, sh well, let's see, the, there have been some issues over the years of people um, not knowing exactly how they can show their support for Hyperledger. Um, people in our community have said, you know, I, you know, I go to meetups, I like to give talks and all that stuff. I want to put it in my Instagram or I want to put it in my email or on my business card. What can I put on there to show my support for Hyperledger? And um, over the last few weeks, behind the scenes i've been working closely with the rest of the hyperledger staff and we came up with this document called showing your support which i just published last night and the goal of this document is to just clarify what we think is acceptable to put on your profiles or in your linkedin um, based on what you see as your role in our community and most of these are very clear cut. Um, you know, if you're an elected TSC member or like you, Arno, 
you know, you would be Hyperledger TSD chair, right? Or technical steering committee chair. It's pretty obvious. The, the goal here is to be as narrow and as precise as possible. So if you're a maintainer, tell us you're a maintainer. Um, then at the top, you can see we have um, rules or roles for everybody or if you consider yourself a champion, if you go above and beyond um, to bring the message and, and to help people get started with Hyperledger, then, you know, if you feel like you're a champion, call yourself a Hyperledger champion. Um, but this was really just us trying to clarify this part of um, participation in our community. And we have consensus on staff. This is what we like. So I thought I'd throw it out here to the TSC to get comments and, and feedback. Um, this is obviously not carved in stone, but the goal here was to be simple. So I, I hope there isn't a lot of disagreement with this. And with that, I'll open the floor for questions before I move on. All right. Nope. <laughs> Any reactions? Any comments? So this is for business cards and LinkedIn profiles and email signatures? Yeah, just if you want to show that you're part of the Hyperledger community in your personal communications, however you have, you know, if you want to put it on there associated with your name, this is how I'm part of Hyperledger. These are sort of, these are the rough guidelines. These are the rules. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think there are some cases where we saw um, uh, folks uh, with LinkedIn um, profiles that uh, characterized the relationship to Hyperledger in a way that looked more formal than it was. Um, then we realized we didn't really have uh, a uh, kind of a standardized approach to that. So this is intended to be one one kind of way to do that. The second is some of you know we had a, a technical ambassador program for a little while. Um, where we try to qualify the people who go out and kind of speak technically on our behalf. And that that got a little complicated to try to manage. Uh, and, and it had us as staff passing judgment on people a lot more often than we cared to. <laughs> um, I, I, and uh, until we get to something more objectively measurable, you know, numbers of commits or something like that, um, we're going to put that on ice uh, just for now. Um, uh, but, but we felt it was still important for people to be able to consistently identify if they want to their relationship to to Hyperledger, um, and so uh, this is it's not intended to be a big deal. I don't I wouldn't expect people to make business cards, but um, you know to the degree people wanted to list this on LinkedIn or, or other places, um, we thought it was at least just worth kind of standardizing on some terminology. Yeah, thanks, Brian, for clarifying. Yeah, th this just gives us a backstop for us to point to if there's some um, disagreement over somebody's professed role in Hyperledger. Um, Mark had a comment here, similar to governing board members as well. That's great, Mark, I'll go ahead and add that. This is really just a formalized, or it's a list of our formal roles in our community, right? That's really what it is. So, let's see, moving on. So, uh, the other item I wanted to bring up was last night I stood up a test instance of a very simple form that Ryan and I and the team want to use leading into the TSC elections this fall. Last year, it was difficult for people to confirm whether they were eligible to vote for the TSC um, election. And so this year, we decided to create this. This is just a simple form. You can type in your email address and you can hit check and it will uh, hash your email, check it against the list of hashes, and if it, if there's a match, then you are in the list of eligible voters. Now, we're populating that list using the scripts that Tracy wrote um, a couple years ago, just like we did last year and the year before. So if you remember the timeline I presented um, in the weeks ahead of the election, Ryan and I will be updating that list pretty much daily. So this... Um, this web app will get updated almost daily with the list um, with the freeze happening what was it like a week be or right before the election opens right so the day before the election opens so um, we're starting earlier this year to get prepared for the election so that we have all the pieces in place and the experience is a lot smoother so just wanted to show you guys this is what we're doing 
Um, and to give a bit more background, um, you, you know, I think we felt uncomfortable publishing a full spreadsheet because that made it really easy for spammers and, and yeah. others to kind of abuse that full list. Obviously, this is all public data. So, um, you, you know, and you can obviously check email addresses that aren't yours. Um, this is also intended to cover aliases where we've identified, you know, there's three different addresses that are actually the same person. Because um, that is a fair bit of, of work that we have to do to try to ensure people don't inadvertently uh, get the right to, to vote twice. Um, but that does require a bit of sleuthing on our part. Right. And you can check any of your email addresses you've used. Um, this one does not try to consolidate um, known aliases. So this is just a raw list, raw check. And um, the current data here is data that I ran for the first half of this year, I think not all of time. So if you check it right now and you're not in the list, that doesn't mean you're not gonna be able to vote. Don't worry about it. It was just some data. Because it, it takes quite a lot of time to crunch the list. And so I just ran it over the last six months. And um, oh yeah, one other point here. Thanks, Brian, for doing that. Um, you can see here that if you aren't in the list, the error here says, please email Arno <laughs> if you think you should be in the list. Um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> why don't we make that a, um, a generic email alias? I, I get it. I, that was a joke for this morning. I, um, Ryan, <laughs> I are still working out the, the, the best way to do it. If you guys have any ideas on how you'd like us to handle this, we're all ears. Otherwise, Ryan, and I, I think are just going to stand up a, an email list and the CA team will just, you know, be a separate email list and we'll just take them as they roll in. Um, yeah. I would make a proposal to put Arnaud's cell phone number there. <laughs> How about his home address? No, yeah. but uh, I, something you said worries me slightly. The, you said this is the raw list. It's not the consolidated list. And um, if I were paranoiac and, you know, I have several email addresses and I could imagine you're going to further process that list and I'm checking my email is there. I'm being told, yep, you're eligible. Then you further process this to consolidate. Somehow a mistake is made and my email address is gone from that list. And now I think I'm in, but I'm not. I got you. That is actually a real um, concern. I think as long as we make sure we're not deleting anything from the list, when we consolidate, really all we're doing when we mean consolidate is to group them so that we don't send out multiple ballots to people. And we don't have a really good solution for that yet. Although um, we think with the LFID stuff that's being changed that, that we will have a solution eventually, but I can't promise that it will be done before this fall's election. So if you're in this list, you're going to get a ballot one way or another. I, I feel comfortable saying that. If you're in this list at the time that the ballots are sent, there may right. be people on this list today, on the list on this list of hashes today, who are no longer eligible because their last commit was uh, eleven months ago. Right, July of 2019. Yeah. So if if that's your point, if you're checking it every day and seeing that you're on the list, um, this is a first cut. This isn't the final list. You know, we're right. not gonna. Uh, this isn't the, the, the list that's going to get ballots um, looking for feedback. Right. And like I said earlier, we're going to be updating this list daily, you know, during the weeks leading up to the election itself. So if you go, if you wait until the day before the election and you check it and you're in it, right, then you're probably fine. Then probably. you're going to get a ballot. Why don't you just put not, the not date of the last commit? Oh, next, like if I punch in an email address, it shows you the date of your last commit. That's actually yeah. a brilliant idea. Oh, good idea, Chris. <laughs> awesome. And you can see the value fields are empty in that, in that uh, dictionary. So yeah, we'll, I'll populate the values with date of last commit. That sounds yeah. like a good idea. Tip, temper that a little bit. Brilliant. You know, acceptable. Thank you, Chris, for your feedback. <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, and it's not just commits, right? Because there are working group people and stuff. They don't have commits. Okay. But, so I, yes. You know, the reason you're on the list somehow is displayed, which can be the last commit if it's a GitHub repo thing. 
Mm, that's so interesting. I, I want I, I want to I, I'm like trying to click through over here as fast as I can to show you something. Um, and faster, rise faster. Yeah, I just <laughs> I, I don't have access to the admin interface in this browser. Um, so this is a uh, an overview that I set up for Hyperledger. This is all of the Hyperledger projects. So if we go to the last uh, one year, right? So that shows us what we would expect to see. This is for yeah. all of the Hyperledger GitHub stuff. However, um, so here's your source code control. Down here we have documentation, Confluence. And if we go down here for view more on Confluence, uh, you actually, uh, we'll see like who are the Confluence editors. As it turns out, Bobby Vippen and I are, you know, up here. And then the, the last action date is shown, you know, so we, we can get there. The, the data yeah, is, just... the data is here. Yeah. So what is Vippen saying if you can't find his name? Uh, because the script that I'm running right now doesn't include that. I think it's oh. just only code code um, commits. It was just dummy data. So For everybody who's listening, if you use it right now, it's just dummy data. It's not a, a comprehensive list. It's not real data. It's just if you're not in the list, don't worry about it. We're just looking for feedback on this form. So this is what I wanted to show as well. You, you can add a space filter here now. I've added all the spaces for projects. Um, and you can see who the top editors are. And it looks like, you know, Arno, Tracy, Hart, you know, people that you would expect are the top editors here. So, yeah. We're working on it. Yeah. We just wanted to let you guys know that we are thinking about this. And we're hoping to be more streamlined and more user-friendly going into the election this fall. Nice. Thanks. So at, 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 the, at, at the risk of uh, beating a dead horse and uh, make Dan and Mark angry about talking about election stuff more again. Um, so, you know, these are good, um, but a lot of this stuff, right, presupposes that you actually know that, I, I guess it, it, there's an assumption that you actually know that there's an election, right? Because at this point, like, to know you're eligible to vote, you're supposed to know about the election. I guess what I was going to ask is, and I probably missed this because somewhere, is there a way for somebody to, and obviously they could come here and if there's changes to like this particular list that has the hashes or something like that, people could subscribe with a GitHub ID and get notifications if we choose to use this voters thing so they know that there's something changing. But is there just something that where somebody could subscribe to to be updated about the election? Like even if they weren't getting the end result where they get their ballot or whatever, but is there just something that as you as we make announcements about the election or changes or even how to check if you're an eligible voter, is there something that people can subscribe to like over time to just who, who care about voting? What we could do, uh, the answer is a no, uh, other than like the TSC list probably. But what we could do is have a wiki page that is an aggregate of this, and I think it exists. Um, I might be wrong, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure that I set up a page for the 20, how to type, 2020 election. Yeah, there's. I have a page with the timeline on it that we discussed a few weeks ago on the TSC. Yeah. There you go, the TSC election plan. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's the timeline. Yeah, this, is, this isn't a public page though. So I, uh, yes. There, there should probably be a page in the TSC space that is this. Right, with all the links to all the tools and links to the rules that makes you eligible, all that stuff. So, That's a good yeah. suggestion, Gary. So here, so here it is, right, <laughs> in the TSC space. So you could subscribe to this page. Okay. Um, it, it obviously hasn't been updated a lot. Right, yeah, the election observers was settled. Same with the election voter selection, that's been settled as well. So those are no longer blocking the election. Right, they're, they're shown as closed. Oh yeah, they are, okay. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, 
just wanted to let everybody know that we're we're already working on making sure the TSC election this year is smooth and, and goes off without a hitch as much as possible. Sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. If not, Great. I think that's the end of uh, today's agenda. Is there anything else anybody else wants to bring up? I would like uh, people to take a look at adopting this. We, we've discussed this several times and I, I just, I want to get this done. You know, either say, yeah, we're going to use hips or no. Um, and if the answer is no, I promise I won't be hurt. I won't cry. Um, the, the reason that I didn't put a lot of effort into editing this is because, you know, it might be a no. Uh, but I think that this would be, it's more congruent with what the projects are doing. I don't remember who suggested this. I will blame Hart for suggesting this. Um, just looking at the list of TSC members. So please take a look. The code's out there. You know, please nitpick and uh, let's do something about it. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And I, I actually did look at it. I should have voiced my uh, my uh, opinion. I mean, I, I thought it looked good. And I, I thought, yeah, that's a good way to move. I'm uh, I'm supportive of uh, moving in that direction. So let's, it's good that you reminded everybody it's out there. I encourage everyone to have a look. And then uh, maybe we can make it part of the next uh, agenda as a formal item and we can have a further discussion or decision on this. I also, Arno, I want, yep, please go sorry, ahead. I want to jump in here. This is Dave Hughesby. There's very few things in the TSC meetings that um, I have like standing to really comment on. And I think the HIP process, the RFC process is really important for us to adopt. Um, mostly because of our software delivery process and being able to trace back changes to proposals um, and design decisions done in the beginning is really about the integrity and our commitment to software engineering correctly, right? Um, the URSA project has been using RFCs since the beginning. And I think a large degree of its cleanliness and its uh, good software engineering comes from that. They, the URSA project does not do things uh, quickly. It's very conservative and as it should be, it's, it's crypto stuff. So um, why don't we review and discuss yeah. this over the next week and then, and then uh, see if there's enough consensus for um, a decision next week. Great. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. I just wanted to put my plus one on this. I really like it. It's good for us. I don't like it then. Uh, and uh, as we uh, as we went through this, I was reminded. I mean, there's also this uh, analytics tool that uh, Ryan has been working on, and uh, you know, we we had a quick uh, overview last time, and uh, I think it's uh, quite promising. And I think you know, one of the things that I'm thinking of requesting is for people when they put their quarterly report together, is to have a link to their status page and um, so we should think about this okay so with this i think we can close the call on uh, that unless anybody else has anything else all right thank you everybody for joining We'll talk again next time. Goodbye. Thanks for now.